Our scripture reading this morning comes from two different passages which I believe are pretty much an echo of each other. The first passage is in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 43, and we'll continue in Galatians 6, beginning in verse 7. I'll read the Matthew 5 passage in the New King James. Beginning in verse 43, Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of, the, of your Father in heaven, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Then to Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. One of the biggest problems that we face is that our perspective is too narrow. We live in a modern world where a broad view of the world where we live is not deemed important or worth the effort to attain. In fact, our modern world really encourages uh, and rewards narrow pursuits and specialized skills and training. It rewards simplistic, self-centered, groupy thinking. Just the culture that we live in. It's sort of a mixed blessing because all the blessings that we enjoy of the modern world would not exist without a specialization. Specialization really is a blessing, but it comes with a price. The drawback is that there is no incentive to develop a broad perspective of our modern world, let alone a broad perspective of history and culture. And I'm convinced that a broad perspective is, is absolutely essential if we want to live our lives in God's kingdom with power and to accomplish very much for the kingdom of God. Those who are dominated by a narrow perspective tend to overlook the vastness of God's purposes and acts in history. If we see ourselves as the most important being on planet Earth, and if we see our desires and our battles as as the center of all history, we will naturally tend to delude ourselves into thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to. And the flip side is true as well. If we think of ourselves as the center of the universe, then what will naturally happen is we will write off other people who are different than us in ways that are very natural, which are ways that are always counterproductive to the growth of the kingdom of God. Wide perspectives about the possibilities always brings a sense of calm balance to kingdom work. And that calm balance is really essential in kingdom work. I'll give you an example where there's a movie out there that explains this fairly well. Just think of this as an artistic example of the benefits of a wide perspective. In the Lord of the Rings movie, the first one, when the Fellowship of the Rings was, were traveling through the caves, uh, there was an interesting discussion between Gandalf and Frodo. Remember that Frodo saw Gollum following them through the caves and he makes this comment, utters this comment, that he wished that Gollum would just die and leave them alone because he had this idea that Gollum was going to cause problems for the fellowship, that he was going to be competition for the ring. And do you remember what Gandalf said to Frodo after Frodo made that comment? And this is a a real contrast between a narrow perspective and a wide perspective, one that is immature, one that is young, and another who is wise and who is older. Gandalf said to Frodo that you should not be so fast in in meeting out death and destruction. For his part, Gandalf (coughs) believed that perhaps Gollum may play a very important part in this quest by the time it was all over. And so this two perspectives about Gollum are placed side by side in that movie, and there's another conversation that was very close in the part of that movie which receives a lot of attention about being such times as these. But that particular perspective that Gandalf brought 
to Frodo's comment about Gollum is just as profound as that other discussion that gets all the publicity. It really was Gandalf's wide perspective that brought Frodo to see a balance, a balance that, that, that widened his perspectives and it ended up to be very true at the end of the movies. We often make Frodo's mistake. We are often so enamored with our own individual existence that we miss God's purposes and grace that take place all around us. In fact, we often miss how God blesses even those whom we would assume to be our adversaries in order to bless us. And we miss really how God really does bless unbelievers in order to bless us. And we miss it because of our perspective, because our perspective is too narrow. Well, our text today in Acts 27 gives us a snapshot of God's purposing grace toward men that would naturally be thought of as the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ and as enemies of the Apostle Paul. Namely, these were officers and and soldiers in the Roman army carrying Paul prisoner to Caesar in Rome. And yet, what is very clear from this text, this entire chapter of Acts 27, is that God extended grace toward them in order to preserve Paul for his mission and extend the kingdom. So let's go to our text and hopefully we can widen our perspective on God's purposes and grace and I think we can see some powerful implications, some parallel applications from this particular text in Acts as we see how God deals with his purposes and grace. Acts chapter 27, we'll continue in our series. And it's a fairly long chapter, but I think it's necessary to to put it all together since it is really all one story. Acts 27, beginning in verse 1. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some of the other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramidim, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so he might provide for his, so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Mar- Mar- Myrin in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off of Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite Salmone. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lazia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle wind, south wind, began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Cotta, we were hardly able to make the lifeboats secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete then you would have spared yourself this damage and and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of the Lord whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you 
the lives of all those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the, from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, You have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. And then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could not swim to jump, who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land in safety. Now that's a fairly interesting example of descriptive writing, and it seems obvious from the very beginning that Luke was an eyewitness to this ocean journey. Um, you can see that by all the we statements that we have here. And there's a couple of places in Acts where we go back between an account about Paul and an account which has we in it. And those places are, of course, places where Luke was probably with Paul. And we see very from the very beginning that Aristarchus was another man who was with Paul and Luke. And to, put, to understand what's going on here, Paul, being a Roman citizen, would, have, would be given a lot of leeway even though he was a prisoner. He was this culture's version of a gentleman in our day. And Rome would allow certain men to be travel with a particular person uh, to carry out the duties or, or requirements that they had on them. And so Luke would probably have been listed as Paul's physician and Aristarchus was, was probably Paul's personal servant. And they were traveling together on their way to Rome. Now also... Uh, it also says in our text that this Paul was in the custody of Julius, a centurion, in the imperial regiment. And the imperial regiment was the Roman Empire's version of the police and escort service. The imperial regiment was not a part of any of the Roman legions. It wasn't a part of the Roman army pr- directly. It was actually a special unit that was self-governing and performed the empire's police and escort service duties. Now what makes this passage, Acts 27, unique in Scripture is how accurate and detailed the account is regarding the details of seamanship in the Mediterranean Sea. And there really is no other account in the Bible which gives us so much detailed attention to sailing. And what's interesting about this is if you put this particular text of Scripture up against and next to historical documents that we have at this period of time that talk about sailing in the Mediterranean Sea, which talk about nautical details, you find that this passage is explicitly correct in all the details that it mentions. In fact, it talks about the shipping routes and habits of the day, which, if you compare with ancient documents, are accurate. It talks about the trade that took place on the Mediterranean Sea, grain ships. We know that also took place in huge amounts on the Mediterranean Sea. It talks about the prevailing wind and weather patterns and seasons. It even talks about the size of the ship and the number of passengers, 276 on the ship, that would actually not have been the largest ship on the Mediterranean Sea. We know that there were ships on the Mediterranean Sea at this time that regularly carried passengers of 350 to 400 people on ships. So all of these different things in this 
account give us um, a, a huge amount of accuracy when compared with ancient documents. It talks about, it also talks about um, this Greek term for the northeaster is Euros, Eurocliden, and Eurocliden was, of course, the word that the that the ancient Greeks and Romans used about these great storms that that blew down on the Mediterranean Sea in late fall and during the winter time. And also, we talks about placing ropes around the hull of the ship to hold the ship together. We also know that was a common practice in this day because the masts of these ships were great big masts and the ropes would actually help hold the uh, foundations of that mast together in rough seas and in stormy weather. So it's remarkable about this passage. When you compare this passage to uh, ancient documents which talk about the details, it really testifies to the accuracy of the scriptures. And many people talk about the scriptures just being stories made up and you know just these things that people, whatever came to mind, they wrote. Well, it's obviously not the case in this particular text because it jives perfectly with ancient history and ancient documents. It really is a statement to the reliability of the New Testament and to the scriptures as a whole. Well, the voyage ran behind schedule late in the year. Luke writes in verse 9 that it was already after the fast, or that would be the Day of Atonement in the Jewish calendar. And this would be late September, probably 20 to 25th of September. And it's a lot like around here that time of year because we can have beautiful days that time of year, just like they could have beautiful days on the, on the Mediterranean Sea, and yet the weather could turn in a heartbeat. I mean, it could look great in the morning and, and then be awful by the afternoon. In fact, Paul warned the centurion in verse 10 that to go any further would likely result in disaster. And it's, it's important here to understand what they were trying to do. They were The first harbor is Fair Havens, in verse 8, is on the southern side of the island of Crete. And the harbor they wanted to go to was also on the southern side of Crete, but it was about 40 miles to the west. And what they were trying to do was go from Fair Havens to Phoenix. But the problem is, the way the geography of Crete is, uh, Crete, the coastline takes a great big northern slope like this. And so to sail across, you actually have to kind of um, get in a place where you're suspect to those great northern winds that come down in late fall and during the wintertime. And so they, even though Paul advised against going further, the majority as well as the captain and the owner of the ship wanted to risk this journey for 40 miles, it's not very far, to a better harbor with a larger, with a larger town. Um, they didn't want the inconvenience of wintering in an inferior harbor with a small town where they would all have to get um, housing accommodations for the winter. And by the way, Crete was known as a place for sailors to stop over, uh, change ships, winter over, or whatever. So they had, the, they had the ability to do the accommodations, but it wasn't convenient. They were willing to risk it for convenience sake. They thought they'd be better off in a better harbor with a larger city. And remember that Paul is no stranger to sailing because at the beginning of Acts, Paul's going around in his missionary journeys and he's doing a lot of sailing. So his advice was informed advice even though he was outvoted on the ship, so to speak. Well, no sooner did they get on the way, since they, they got this breeze that they figured would carry them, than this great storm caught them right where they were helpless. And what would happen is, as you're sailing along the coastline, if the wind was too great coming down out of the north, it would blow you away from the island of Crete out into the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And so this was a dangerous a dangerous thing, but it was something that they were willing to try to do and what happened was they caught it right at the wrong time with this great storm. And we've all done our travels, we've all risked it for convenience sake, so it's, it's relatively easy to understand why the captain and the pilot would be willing to just risk it another couple days or even a day, if you had a good day, to get to a better harbor. But that's exactly what they did for convenience sake. Verse 15 talks about what happened. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind coming down out of the north and the coastline of course runs toward the north so they're getting pushed right away from the island Crete. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed through the lee of a small island named Cotta we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of service, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard 
On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Now, of course, the ship and the crew are in all kinds of danger. It was in the open sea during a season known for its storms. The wind was pushing them toward the coast of Africa and certain death on the shallows of Sirtis. Actually, it's an interesting geographical um, mention because we know of two different places where there were shallows along the coast of Africa where if a ship got stuck on it, it would either be destroyed or it would just be stuck there with no way to escape miles and miles from the coast of Africa. On top of that, the storm blocked all reference to the sun and the stars, which these sailors used to navigate. And if you're a sailor at this point in time, that's all you had to go on. So if you couldn't see the sun or the stars, you had no idea where you were as far as latitude and longitude, and you had no idea which direction you were going. And so um, this is a very serious, serious situation. And what they ended up doing was dropping a sea anchor to slow the ship down from being blown right into the coast of Africa, which they knew was not that far away. And notice again in verse 20 that Luke includes himself in with the other passengers as hopeless in the face of the devastating storm and their prospects for surviving. So obviously Luke considered himself just like everyone else, hopeless before what they were facing. Verse 21. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the, Lord, of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. That's a remarkable claim being in a situation that they were in, that not one of them would perish to the storm. And Paul makes it clear that they had made a disastrous mistake in ignoring his advice. And I was reading some commentaries, and some commentaries say, you know, Paul's just over the top here. I mean, it's, I told you so. Right when they're all worried about they're all going to be dying, it's just totally unnecessary. It's just human for Paul to say that. And I actually don't think that Paul was, was uh, over the top in saying that. I think he was really trying to get at something and impact them with the idea that uh, they really don't deserve to live given the decisions that they made, given the conditions that they all put themselves in. He was really telling them that they really don't deserve to come out of this alive um, given all those things. The sea doesn't have any compassion. That's one thing about um, being outdoors in various different situations. You realize very quickly if you think about it at all, the weather and the sea and the mountains and, and the creation itself has no compassion it will brutally uh, make you pay for any mistakes like these men made. But Paul's God did care about where they were. And this is really where the, the, the passage gathers around a basic, a basic um, statement. In a vision, Paul was told that he must stand trial before Caesar and for Paul's own sake, God had, had given a gracious promise of life to all the men who sailed with him. And that would be something that if the passengers believed Paul would bring about a great deal of courage because that would be something that they could could latch on to for hope that they would actually survive the ordeal and come out of it on the other side alive. But notice that the promise of grace was given to them solely because of Paul's mission in order that Paul would be brought to stand trial before Nero. And so God blessed them all. God gave them undeserved favor, grace, for the sake of of Paul and his mission and God's mission for Paul. So what is remarkable about this text is that God spares unbelievers, even blesses unbelievers with grace for the sake of believers, for the sake of God's purposes, for the sake of his kingdom. Now, how many of these passengers actually believed Paul at this point in time? What's clear is that when Paul made this statement, it didn't calm the sea. It didn't end the storm like we saw with Jesus and his disciples. It didn't stop at immediate like like when um, the sailors threw Jonah overboard. There was still this unbroken danger that they all faced, even with this promise that Paul put out them. And we don't know how many actually believed Paul. In fact, it's very obvious that the crew 
did not believe Paul because very, in very few verses from here, the crew's trying to escape from the ship, save their own skin. So obviously not everyone believed Paul, but um, I'm sure that this would have been a reason for hope for those who did believe Paul. Verse 27. On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. If you've ever seen the seashore in videos or in pictures of, of Greece, of this area of the Mediterranean, um, you'll realize real quick why these guys were really scared when they realized that they were coming close to land. The seashore in this area is mostly rocky reefs, cliffs, and jagged coast as the land juts up out of the Mediterranean Sea. And so just imagine this, sitting on a boat that's probably being pushed through the water at a high rate of speed, maybe 50, 55, 60 miles an hour, and knowing that you're coming toward the seashore and knowing what the seashore is like in this area have been terrifying. The chances of anyone surviving a a, a head-on collision with, with rocky reefs at 50, 60, 65 miles an hour is nil, let alone everyone surviving like Paul said. And so they threw out uh, as many anchors probably that they had to stop the ship and prayed for daylight. Also notice that the crew made an attempt to escape from the ship once they knew that they were close to land. And Paul makes a very interesting statement in light of God's promise that all the passengers um, would, would be saved. Paul tells the centurion and the soldiers in verse 31, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Now, that lends itself to an interesting question as you follow the story here. Would God's promise of grace that all these passengers would be saved be voided if the crew escaped? Remember, think about what Paul had already told him. He already told him, in a vision, the angel of the Lord told me that everyone's going to make it out alive. And then when he sees this plot to, for the crew to escape, he tells the centurion, it, unless they stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And how do you reconcile those two statements? How do you make sense of them when they seem to be contradictory logically? Well, this is another beautiful example of how God's predestination and human action work together in God's purposes. You know, Paul did not approach the situation in a wooden predestinarian fashion. He said the human actions and choices are irrelevant because God has already predetermined for something to happen. Paul did not approach this situation quite in that way. Paul operates very differently. He's, he knows that the crew is necessary to guide the ship. And at all times that the crew was necessary, it was at this point in time, when they are actually coming close to land, it would be necessary for the crew to actually guide the ship to find a safe place for them to beach the boat, so to speak. It was out in the middle of the ocean when they couldn't see stars or the sun and they were just being pushed by the waves that the crew was unnecessary. Now Paul understands that the crew is necessary to guide the ship toward land safely. And Paul knew that God had promised safety for all the passengers, so he participated in what God had already promised and made his actions, um, his actions brought about the warning to the centurion that, and soldiers that the crew were trying to escape. Now, Paul didn't lie here. I don't believe that Paul lied by saying that well, if the crew gets away, you're all going to die. After he said that, well, God, God has already told me that everyone's going to survive. But what, is, what this is a great example is, of is how God's plan is accomplished through the will and providence of God and the actions that Paul engaged in. And I've said this many times over. When it comes to God's plan and, and predestination and providential control of working out his will in history, it's really not a question of either God or man. And this is a perfect example of how Paul is participating and cooperating in God's plan to bring, about, to bring about God's will in all of the details. Both Paul, and I would also say the centurion himself, also made the right decision as well, made decisions which participated in God's providence. Verse 33, 
Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all, and then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land in safety. Remarkable statement about Paul's evangelism even in the eating of food on the ship in the presence of all the passengers he gave thanks to God in front of them all he broke it and began to eat and of course that encouraged them to eat which brought up their strength gave them enough strength to actually survive but at the end here as if they all had not faced enough danger for one journey when it finally looked like they were actually going to make it a whole new new danger for Paul and the other prisoner prisoners appear. Remember that a Roman guard had tremendous responsibility for those whom he guarded in this empire. If a Roman guard allowed a prisoner to escape, he would stand trial for the charges that that prisoner was on trial for. And so it was very simple to the soldiers. Better dead prisoners than lost prisoners. And this, of course, was a real danger for Paul because Paul at this time, even though he had all the liberty that he had, was a prisoner. And you see this plan to kill all the prisoners so that they would not escape. Well, the grace that the centurion extended toward the prisoners and especially toward Paul is the only natural response to the grace that he was shown. And as you go through this account, you can see how the centurion had treated Paul with kindness from the very beginning. Perhaps he was one of the eminent men of the city of Caesarea who witnessed Paul back during the investigation before Felix and King Agrippa. Maybe he was impressed by Paul. Maybe he was impressed by Paul's personality. Certainly he was thankful to Paul in that he, his leadership and faith really brought them through the storm with hope. So this grace that, that was shown to the centurion and now coming out the other side likely alive from his perspective at this point would have, would have caused him to extend grace toward Paul and the prisoners and that's exactly what he does even though he did not take Paul's advice to winter at the harbor of Fairhaven, there is no way that he would choose to allow Paul to be killed along with the other prisoners. So again, God's will is being worked out through the decisions and the choices that were being made at all levels on the ship. Now, of all things that happened in this account, I think perhaps the most significant is the fact that we, God would spare and bless all the passengers on the ship for Paul's sake because they were with Paul. Really, no, no other reason. I mean, you can ask yourself, if Paul had not been on the ship, do you think anybody would have survived? I mean, you read the account and what actually took place and you don't get the sense that this would have been something that they would have survived from except for the fact of God's direct providence and control and um, the, the existence of Paul's mission. Now, if you think about that snapshot of God being gracious, purposing grace, not just to Paul, but also to those who sailed with him, you see how that can have profound implications in our modern covenantal world as well. It will broaden your perspectives if you think about the fact that God saved unbelievers for Paul's sake, for nothing else, for no other reason that we know of, that we have recorded for us, other than for Paul's sake. God blesses and extends grace to unbelievers in order to accomplish something. And again, we have a narrow perspective sometimes that is limited to our self-centered experience. 
It's easy to live narrowly and divide the world up into believers and unbelievers, those who are blessed and those who are cursed. Sort of an us versus them kind of thing. And I, and I do believe that there is a difference between believers and unbelievers. But when you look at texts like this, you realize real quickly that it's kind of a simplistic mistake to think that God always acts out this blessing and cursing in some kind of a wooden, black and white way. And it's remarkable how, again, 273 people, not counting Aristarchus, Paul, and Luke, at least, would have been saved for the sake of Paul. And really for no other reason that they deserved after they made the decision to go out in the sea at that point in time. I would say it's not just... This is widening your perspective here. It's not just an issue for an us versus them thing with Christians because I think that in our nation, in America right now, you see this very same narrowing of perspective going on in the political realm, going on with our military expeditions around the world. And I think that it's a very dangerous thing. The Americans have this us versus them thing as well and they don't recognize that there are many other countries on this earth that are put here that are blessed for our good as well and Americans tend to have this idea well it's just us we're right we're always right and they're always wrong when very, it very well could be that there may be some great wisdom in listening to other nations and listening to other cultures and, and acting toward them in grace rather than according to our narrow perspective, using bombs and, and bullets and everything else. But this happens especially with, with Christians when Christians get a narrow perspective of how God purposes His grace to work in the world and they get themselves into a us-versus-them black-and-white situation that doesn't allow for God to be very complex in how He works His purposes and how He blesses His own people through blessing even unbelievers. And that's exactly, I believe, how it takes place. God's purposes and grace are much, much more complex and abundant than we would naturally admit, especially if we allow ourselves to be seduced by that Jonah complex that we all know about. That's just them. I hope something bad happens to them. You know, God can't be gracious to them because they're so evil and walk away. It's really something that... Uh, once we see the scope of God's purposes and grace, it's only natural for us to imitate God by following Paul's exhortation to, good, to do good to all people, especially to those who believe. And Paul didn't have this idea that of, of praying down imprecatory psalms all the time on those who persecuted him. There are situations where Paul, and they were very warranted, where those who harden themselves against the gospel and who... Um, consciously begin to make war on the saints in which it is a time to pray down God's curses on unbelievers. I don't deny that. But what is remarkable is that God can bless His people. God can accomplish His purposes by blessing even unbelievers. And we can see that in the economic realm as well today. We work for, lots of us work for people who are unbelievers. And we, we consider that work as our blessing. And we work for people who have Lots of money. And so it may be that God has chosen to bless them even though they don't deserve it. Grace. That's, that's what grace is. In order to bless us. And so we can see that in the economic realm. We can see that in many different ways. Uh, techno technology is another good example of how that takes place. And we can recognize that God's purposes and grace are sometimes very complex and not quite so simple as we narrow-mindedly think of it many times. Well, that's the mindset that broadens our perspective and balances us against a perpetual, self-centered lust for bad things to befall those around us, which, ironically, of the whole thing in this covenantal world, it is amazing how self-defeating it is to wish bad things on people around you. Because in the end, in this covenantal world, when bad things befall people around you, it is only something that will befall you as well. Just like Paul, if the ship went down, Paul would have gone down with it. Let's pray.